Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrew Allen, and I am the Historical Programs Manager for the American Revolution Institute of the Society of the Cincinnati, and I'm delighted to welcome you to tonight's virtual author's talk. The American Revolution Institute promotes knowledge and appreciation of the achievement of American independence by supporting advanced study, exhibitions, and other historical programs, advocating preservation, and providing resources to classrooms. Since 1938, the Society of the Cincinnati has done this work from its headquarters, Anderson House, a National Historic Landmark finished in 1905 as the winter residence of Lars and Isabel Anderson in Washington, D.C. Tonight's author's talk fe features Professor James McIntyre, who will discuss his forthcoming book, A Most Gallant Resistance, the Delaware River Campaign, September through November 1777. By October of 1777, British forces had occupied Philadelphia. Yet an elaborate American defense of the Delaware River crippled the British supply lines and threatened their ability to hold the city. In his forthcoming book, A Most Gallant Resistance, the Delaware River Campaign, September through November, 1777, James McIntyre discusses the massive effort by the Crown forces to gain control of the strategic waterway. He highlights the British occupation of Philadelphia, the American defense of the river, and several often neglected engagements, such as the successful repulse of a Hessian attack on Fort Mercer in New Jersey, the destruction of two Royal Navy vessels the following day, and the siege of Fort Mifflin. McIntyre asserts that the fighting along the Delaware River warrants an important place in the narrative of the 1777 Philadelphia campaign. James McIntyre received his bachelor's degree in history from Temple University and his master's from the University of Illinois. His main interest is the American War of Independence, on which he has written numerous articles and papers. He is the author of The Development of the British Light Infantry, Continental and North American Influences, 1740 to 1765, published in 2016, and Johann Ewald, a Jaeger commander, published in 2021. Additionally, he is the translator and editor of Johann Ewald Thoughts of a Hessian Officer on what has to be done during a tour with a detachment in the field that was published in 2020. He is an assistant professor of history at Moraine Valley Community College near Chicago, Illinois, and serves as a fleet professor in the United States Naval War College's College of Distance Education, Strategy, and War Department. Now, before I turn things over to Professor McIntyre, a few housekeeping items are in order. Following this evening's talk, there will be a question and answer session. Please feel free to submit questions for Professor McIntyre using the Q&A function found at the bottom of your screen. Should you have any technical related questions or comments, those can be submitted using the chat function and one of our staff members will be monitoring that and will do their best to assist you. Now it is my distinct pleasure to welcome Professor James McIntyre. Thank you, Andrew. And uh, I'd like to thank the Society of the Cincinnati and certainly Anderson House for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, so, uh, most gallant resistance, the defense of the Delaware River forts and October, November, 1777. Uh, what I plan to do is to give some background on the significance of Philadelphia and then uh, discuss what exactly these river defenses were. And then from there, focus on the importance of the British, the importance to the British of breaking through said defenses and their efforts to do so. And then finally, uh, draw some conclusions from that. So without any further hesitation, uh, this then cannot be called an inglorious campaign. So wrote Surgeon Albigens Waldo from Valley Forge concerning the 1777 campaign in Pennsylvania. His observation seems particularly applicable to the fighting that occurred in and around the Delaware River between October 1st and November 16th, 1777. As I examined the contest for control of the Delaware River in late, in late 1777, I will argue that for contemporaries, this campaign held much greater significance than subsequent historians have allowed. Now, in order to do this, it is necessary to provide some idea of the importance of Philadelphia and the attempts of its leadership to defend the city from maritime incursions. So Philadelphia in 1776, uh, it emerged as the largest city in North America. It included something around 5,000 dwellings and 30,000 or 33,000 other buildings, I'm sorry, and had a population of between 30 and 40,000. 
making it the fourth largest city in the British Empire. In addition, the city boasted nearly three miles of waterfront with nearly 100 docks and wharves, um, and these could service over 100 ships a year, easily up to 1,000 ships a year. Uh, in order to protect these vessels and their cargoes, the city maintained actually a police force and several fire companies in the 1770s. The wealth generated by the port helped to support thri a thriving cultural and intellectual community as well. The city proper encompassed an area of approximately eight blocks west of the Delaware River. If the suburbs of Northern Liberties and the Southwark were included, then the area would expand to about 14 blocks. Beyond these urbanized areas, there were sprawling farms and a scattering of country houses. The economic wealth produced by the city's port made it an attractive target as well. This was not lost on the merchants and artisans of the city who were aware of the possible threat and attempted to create some form of defense. Initial efforts, however, were blocked by the ruling Quaker elite. Still, as the contest with the mother country grew more heated, those who sought to change the political status quo in the colony saw an opportunity. The revolution created an opening for those dissatisfied with the rule of the Penn family to challenge the balance of power. The more radical members of the Pennsylvania Assembly essentially pushed the governor of the colony, John Penn, aside disregarding his authority. In his place, the members of the legislature created the Pennsylvania Committee of Safety on June 30th, 1775. This body would act as the executive for the colony. The committee included many prominent Philadelphians such as Benjamin Franklin, Robert Morris, Owen Biddle, and Anthony Wayne. Altogether, it was composed of some 25 members, though if necessary, seven could serve as a quorum. The committee met for the first time on July 3rd as a testament to the importance of the maritime defense of the city, the second resolve the body passed after the one creating itself, tasked it with defending against armed ships or vessels sailing up the Delaware River. Over the following two years, the leadership developed an impressive defense in depth to shield Philadelphia. They constructed and placed several rows of large sunken obstructions known as chevaux de frise, pictured here. Um, in addition, now these were essentially large wooden boxes towed out to different areas, different spots in the river. They were custom built to be sunk at a depth where the points of those projecting spears would be about six feet under water level. So just far enough to be hard to discern. Um, the tips though are sheathed in iron. And this is an example of one of the tips. This is actually at Fort Mifflin on the Pennsylvania side, uh, which leads to the next point. In addition to cover these obstructions, the committee ordered several forts at Fort Mifflin on Mud Island in Pennsylvania at Red Bank, uh, later known as Fort Mercer on the New Jersey side. And finally, further south on the New Jersey side, essentially opposite of Chester, Pennsylvania, Billingsport. Uh, this is a current picture. There, there really are no contemporary pictures of Billingsport. There are some maps and I will show those. Um, you, you can vaguely notice some remains of, of the structure along the beach here, if you look very carefully. Okay. In addition, they can, the Pennsylvania uh, Committee of Public Safety essentially created its own state Navy, which consisted of the ships listed here. And again, for two years worth of work, this is a pretty impressive accomplishment, especially when, when one thinks about their, their attention is not always focused on local defense. Very often it is drawn away by threats such as, you know, the, the British moving south at the end of 1776 and the, the Trenton Princeton campaign and the 10 crucial days. Um, in, in addition to this defensive network to really integrate things, they constructed a series of warning posts with signal guns that started in the Delaware Bay, Bay at Luz and made its way up to just south of Philadelphia. 
So essentially, they've created this integrated defense in depth. Okay, uh, any British ships coming up the river would encounter the Chevaux de Frey, and if they were to try and attempt to to move some of these out of the way to create an opening, the forts. Uh, so there's Billings Port. There's the lower row of Chevaux de Frey, if you can follow my mouse. Uh, there is Fort Mifflin on Mud Island, more Chevaux de Frey, okay. uh, Boom and Chain, and also uh, Fort Mercer here at Red Bank on the New Jersey side. Uh, so at each step, there, there are these integrated defenses that would exact quite the toll from any, any group trying to make their way up the river. Now, there were some early tests of these defenses, and, and I do discuss these in the book. These occur in May of 1776. Still, the great test of the river defenses came in October and November of 1777, and this followed the British victory at the Battle of Brandywine on September 11th, uh, as well as the, the desolatory Battle of the Clouds on the 16th. Um, and then there are these maneuvers on September 26th, the British occupy the city of Philadelphia. Uh, you know, Earl Charles Cornwallis leads a British column in with the loyalist Joseph Galloway at his side. Here's the crucial strategic problem for William Howe, pictured here. Much of the army's equipment is still on the transports that are with his brother Richard's fleet uh, that had been at, at head of elk, but has now made its way back down into the Chesapeake and up into the Delaware Bay. But really to get these vital supplies to the army, the fleet needs to get to Philadelphia. To do that, they have to break through these defenses. Howe's first attempt to do this, now there are British troops uh, sp spread throughout the region. There are units down in Wilmington. So on October 1st, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Sterling, along with elements of the 10th, 71st, and 42nd regiments, crossed the Delaware at Chester and made their way across from Billings Island uh, to Billingsport. At this point, now Billingsport was constructed to hold a garrison of 1,500. At this point, it had approximately 300, uh, many of them. New Jersey militia. The fort itself was poorly situated. All the guns and, and the main finished walls focused out to the river. The rear of this post is open. And so we can see on this map, um, here's Sterling's force, there's the 42nd, there's the 10th moving in. And so the garrison realizing that they are very much outnumbered, abandon the post, some make their way north into further up the coast. Others are transported off by elements of this Pennsylvania Navy and brought up to Fort Mifflin. So essentially, uh, Billingsport falls without a fight. Some historians have criticized Sterling because he did not proceed further. If he had moved northwards over Manto Creek, uh, he could have gotten to Red Bank, which at that point had no garrison. For his part, Sterling did not know this, and he'd accomplished his mission, so he simply withdrew back across the Delaware River to Chester. Um, the next attempt, from October 2nd, 3rd, on till about October 20th, the Howe brothers focus their efforts on bombarding these other two forts, specifically Fort Mifflin on Mud Island. This isn't really progressing quickly enough, and the concern is to get the transports to Philadelphia before the river freezes. Confer conversely, on the American side, the goal is to prevent the transports from getting to Philadelphia and, you know, before the river freezes. So Howe, losing patience, decides to launch a ground assault against the fort at Red Bank, Fort Mercer. Initially, he had sought to use British forces. However, Colonel Count Carl Emil von Dunup, 
from Hess Cassell had requested the honor to lead the assault. Now, again, with the Hessians, uh, they were they perceived themselves as being having been disgraced at Trenton the earlier in the year, okay, or at the end of the preceding year. So von Donop is looking for an opportunity to regain their honor. He requests the honor of leading the attack. How grants it? Um, and and when interestingly, when von Donop asked what were his orders, how should he take the fort? Hal essentially said by direct assault, it's up to you. Um, von Donop brings with him, okay, uh, the grenadier companies of von Minigrod, von Linsingen, von Lengerk, also the von Mirbach regiment, as well as um, 10 three pounder artillery piece. Now these are field pieces, these are not designed to batter down fortifications. In the interim, uh, Washington has now begun to take more interest in these Delaware River forts. And so he has sent okay, uh, Colonel Christopher Green pictured here. Uh, Green was from Pontuxet, Rhode Island. He was the cousin of Nathaniel Green, served in the Kentish Guards along with Nathaniel Green, responded to the Lexington alarm uh, later in 1775, took part in the failed invasion of Canada, was captured at Quebec and exchanged, and was now, along with Major Israel Engel, in command of the 1st and 2nd Rhode Island regiments, which are sent into Fort Mercer. Along with them, Washington sends a very talented French engineer, Captain Madouit de Plessis. The Plessis, on inspecting the fort, realizes, and, and we can see on this really excellent Hessian map, realizes that the, the initial construction, again, is too large for the garrison. Again, it was built to hold over a thousand troops. The combined garrison is 400. The Plessis then comes up with the idea of abandoning and sealing off a section of the fort with an abatis, as we see here. So from dawn up leaves from the Arch Street Ferry early on the morning of October 21st. The overall plan as it evolved was this. On October 23rd, uh, the Hessian column would launch its attack on Fort Mercer and it would get some support from the large British warships uh, off in the Delaware River. Uh, who would also be attacking, this was to be an all out assault on Fort Mifflin as well as Fort Mercer. Von Donop's impatient. He gets to Haddonfield that night, early in the morning on October 21st or 22nd, he, he sets his column in motion once again. They arrive before the fort at noon. Uh, Von Donop calls on the fort to surrender. They, they refuse. He then spends about four hours ordering his men to make fascines that they can use to basically build up a wall to get up over the ramparts of Fort Mercer because uh, they had failed to bring along any scaling ladders. At approximately, now as this is all going on, Captain Johann Ewald of the second company Heskesel Jaeger is present at this location and as he's surveying things, uh, he, you know, he gives, leaves us this account. I approached the fort up to rifle shot range and found that it was provided with a breastwork 12 feet high, palisaded and dressed with assault stakes. They're, they're gonna try and use fascine bu stick bundles to, to ascend this wall. Avald went on to discuss the demeanor of the officers as they prepared for the assault. I met Colonel Stewart with a drummer who was to summon the fort, and right behind them, I met Major Pauly, Captain Krug, and both adjutants of the colonel. All these gentlemen regarded the affair with levity. The only man who had any real knowledge and looked upon the business as serious was worthy old Captain Krug. I took this man aside and asked him what he thought of the undertaking, whereupon he answered, he who has seen the forts or fortified places taken with sword in hand 
will not regard this affair as a small matter. If the garrison puts up a fight and has a resolute commandant, we have let luck slip through our fingers. We should not have summoned the fort, but immediately taken it by surprise on our arrival. Almost prophetically, Captain Krug concluded, but now they will make themselves ready. And if our preparations are not being made better than I hear, we will get a good beating. The assault on Red Bank was composed of two columns that were to make their attacks simultaneously, one from the north and the other from the south. Their timing, however, was not uniform. And the northern assault, which was to go into what they did not know yet was the abandoned section of the fort, jumped off first. The men made their way over the outer ramparts with ease, thinking that the rebels had abandoned the fort you know, we're giving up without a fight. They start to move in, inward. They get to the abatis, and as they're struggling over that obstruction, a massive volley, and Green and Angel had moved the entire garrison to this northern wall. They unleash this devastating body, volley, which breaks the attack. Meanwhile, they had raised a flag that signaled the galleys of the Pennsylvania Navy, and they came in and lent fire support as the southern column is making its way to the attack. Both of these were driven back with heavy losses. Uh, Israel Angle of the second Rhode Island gave this description. When the enemy arrived within musket shot about one o'clock, we fired a cannon or two at them on which they retired and kept skulking in the woods until half after four o'clock when they sent a flag demanding the fort, but answered the fort was not to be given on any terms. They answered that if we still remained obstinate, our blood might be upon our own heads, for we should have no mercy shown us. Our answer was we asked for none and expected none. And so they parted in about 10 minutes after there began a smart fire as ever I heard from eight field pieces and two howitz, these are howitzers, uh, they had placed against us. At the same time, they advanced in two columns to attack our fort by storm, when there begun an incessant fire of mus musketry, which continued 40 minutes, when the Hessians retreated in the most precipitate manner, leaving 200 killed and wounded in the field, we spent the greatest part of the night in bringing in the wounded. Likewise, Lieutenant Carl Friedrich Hoifa of the Regiment von Mierbach, who was wounded in the assault, presented a poignant description from the Hessian perspective. We took both the outer defenses with little effort. He was in the Northern attack. This had hardly occurred when because of the extensive losses an indescribable cannonade and small arms fire from the fort and from the enemy ships lying in the waterside, which fired on our right wing necessitated a withdrawal without accomplishing our purpose. So again, both attacks are, are beaten off Von Dunup was wounded in the hip and taken to the nearby farmhouse of Jacob Whitehall, a lo local Quaker. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel von Linsigen assumes command and led the retreat, which made their way back in the direction they had come. Now, some have criticized Green for not, you know, sallying out of the fort and pursuing the Hessians, turning a defeat into a rout. Green, for his part, you know, needs to get an, an idea of the operational situation he's in, tally their ammunition, check to the wounded of both sides, and so forth. Um, still, this was not the only loss. Remember, these British ships were making their way up the Delaware. And in the process, oops, I gave away the surprise. Sorry about that. In the process, um, one of them, the HMS Augusta, became mired on a sandbar. As the rest as their other British ships go back down the Delaware that night, the Augusta is stuck in place. October 23rd, the date slated for this all out attack. October 23rd dawns, and the Augusta is still where she was the night before. She is singled out for special attention from the batteries at Mud Island, as well as the ships of the Pennsylvania Navy. Um, around 11:30, between 10 and 11.30, she catches fire. The HMS Merlin goes in to try and get her off the sandbar, 
and to rescue some of the men on board. Okay. Um, around noon, the fire spread. Now there's a great deal of, of controversy over what started the fire. Was it wadding from one of the Augusta's own guns? Was it a, hot, a heated cannonball, potentially from Mud Island and so forth? In any case, uh, Thomas Paine, who was actually on his way to White Marsh, wrote in a letter to Benjamin Franklin, we were stunned about noon with a report as loud as a peal of a hundred cannon at once. He continued, turning round, I saw thick smoke rising like a pillar spreading from the top like a tree. And that was the Augusta exploding. Meanwhile, um, Captain Francois Fleury, another French engineer, this one stationed at Fort Mifflin, wrote in a letter to Alexander Hamilton, um, one of our bullets or one from the fleet set fire to the Augusta, a 64 gun ship, which was nearest our battery and did most mischief. Another vessel of 20 guns, that's the Merlin, uh, was also caught fire. Among the more dramatic accounts of the death of the Augusta comes from Colonel Thomas Hartley of Hartley's additional Continental Regiment. Writing Thomas Wharton, the president of the Supreme Executive Council at the time, Hartley stated, about 11 o'clock, we heard a monstrous explosion which shook the neighboring county and a prodigious column of smoke rose towards the heavens. Initially, we feared it might be the magazine at the fort. However, better fortune awaited America. So the Augusta explodes, the Merlin catches fire and has to be abandoned. So two British ships, one, a man of war are lost. Uh, this was seen as a tonic for Patriot spirits, especially in the Philadelphia area. Remember, you know, they've lost at Brandywine. The attempt at Germantown is, is driven off. Congress had to run out of Philadelphia and, and take up residence in York. And so uh, John, Henry Lawrence of South Carolina wrote to Robert Howe from York on October 25th, the Delaware affair, which you will find upon a piece is, another piece is glorious. He could not, Lawrence could not resist a bit of play on words. Don't you think those cannoneering heroes, Commander or Commodore Hazelwood, commander of the Pennsylvania Navy, Colonel Smith, commander of Fort Mifflin, and Colonel Green of Rhode Island deserve to be canonized. The members of the Continental Congress understood the importance of these events. In a letter from the Committee on Foreign Affairs to the commissioners then working in Paris, they noted not only Burgoyne's surrender, but the successful defense of Fort Mercer and the sinking of Augusta and Merlin as well. So following their report on the preceding events, they joined the commissioners in France. We rely on your wisdom and care to make the best and most immediate use of this intelligence to depress our enemies and produce essential aid to our cause in Europe. So here's Lauren's quote. Um, for anyone interested in addition. So the wreckage of the Augusta actually remained in the Delaware River for some time. In the research for this project, I came across several photographs, including this. This is part of the spine of the Augusta as dredged from the Delaware at the beginning of the 20th century um, and brought up onto the New Jersey side of the river. So now attention at both sides focused on Fort Mifflin. Okay, now pictured here is Captain John Montresor. And so local legend has it that Montresor uh, had, laid out the, had laid out Fort Mifflin and, start, and constructed it. So later on he was, you know, his task with destroying the fort he built. That's false, that's not true. Uh, essentially what happened, Governor John Penn reached out to um, the commander of British forces in North America in the 1760s, you know, this idea of building some defenses along the river. And Montresor, who was chief engineer, was sent to Philadelphia. He laid out several plans, which included Mud Island, but to build a stable fortification would have required the use of pylons, which made it a very expensive project. 
Uh, his designs were rejected. He left Philadelphia without building anything. Okay, but he will take part in destroying the fort. Um, Montresor, beginning on November sixth, well, actually, well, be ahead of this, had been setting up shore batteries along the Delaware, and we can see on this map uh, on the right-hand side some of the batteries being set up on the mainland. This was a map uh, created by uh, Fleury, the engineer at Fort Mifflin. And it gives us one of the best depictions of the fort as it existed during the War of Independence. Now there is a Fort Mifflin on the Delaware, but that, that fort was built on the location of the original, but it was built after the revolution. It was uh, built in the early 19th century. At any rate, by early November, the weather is starting to intervene on these efforts of the British to break through the defenses. Uh, as Montresor recorded in his diary on November 6th, the weather too wet for the troops to work on ridouts. Okay. Even with these delays, Montresor was able to report by the 10th that we opened our batteries against Mud Island Fort, the whole consisting of two 32 pounders, six 24 pounders, one 18 pounder, two eight inch howitzers, two eight inch mortars, and one 13 inch mortar. So the British are, are getting pretty serious about this attempt to break down the American defenses. Um, of those in the fort, Joseph Plum Martin is probably the most recognized and most read. Now, Martin wrote his account much later in life, but it, if you read it, it is still very poignant. It's clear that his experiences during this siege remained very vivid in his memory for, for years to come. Uh, for example, he notes during the early stages, during the whole night, at intervals of a quarter to a half an hour, the enemy would let off all their pieces. And although we had sentinels to watch and at every flash of their guns to cry a shot, upon hearing which everyone endeavored to take care of himself. So the, the British are attempting to deprive the garrison of sleep. In addition, they would bombard the fort heavily during the day and destroy the embrasures, knock down the palisades, Sorry about that. And the, the PowerPoint seems to want me to pick up the pace. At any rate, uh, during the night, Fleury would lead work details to do his best to repair the damage incurred during the day. Okay. Meanwhile, the Chevaux de Free had actually altered the water levels in the Delaware. This back channel be between Fort Island and the mainland on the Pennsylvania side had been made deeper. And so the British realized if they could lighten several of their vessels, they might be able to get them in behind the fort and then essentially unleash a pulverizing bombardment from the ships in the river, the land batteries and these additional ships. So they, they did this. They had um, an old East Indiaman, the Empress of Russia renamed the HMS Vigilant. They removed all the guns except for a few on one side and then lashed it to some trees on the Pennsylvania shore. And they backed it up with another smaller ship, the HM Fury, brought these into the back channel. And so this was all prepared by November 15th. And they unleash the largest cannonade in North America prior to the Battle of Gettysburg. They pulverized the fort. Uh, the commander, Lieutenant Colonel Samuel Smith, is wounded and, and removed. In his stead, one of the Rhode Islanders, Major Simeon Thayer, volunteers to assume command. He takes over for the last day or so of the bombardment. Uh, on the night of November 15th, 16th, the remnants of the garrison abandon what, what's left. They set fire to whatever hadn't been destroyed and sailed over to the New Jersey side. Okay. And here we see uh, an artist depiction of that bombardment on the 15th. Shortly thereafter, the Americans decide to abandon Red Bank uh, because it no longer serves a purpose. And on November 18th, Cornwallis crossed over the Delaware, again at Billingsport, with about 5,000 crown troops and was moving northward. And, and if you're familiar with Cornwallis, he is a very aggressive commander. 
so if he's moving towards Red Bank and, and there's a garrison there, there will be a fight. At any rate, they abandon the post. And so this brings us to the outcomes and conclusions. Okay, most often this is the, this campaign is not even discussed in general histories of the war. There's Brandywine, there's Germantown, and that's it. Um, and so it brings up some questions, right? Was this a defeat or a successful delaying action? And I argue that it's a, a nearly successful delaying action. Remember, the purpose became to prevent the British from gaining access to Philadelphia via the Delaware before the river froze. They almost succeeded. A few weeks later, the Delaware River does freeze. Okay. Um, in addition, some historians have asserted, uh, John Furling among them, in Almost a Miracle, that William Howe probably lost half as many men in the fighting along the Delaware. And think of, you know, for the attack on Fort, Fort Mercer. He probably lost half as many as he did at Brandywine and Germantown. Like these are some significant setbacks. They're major wins. And as, as previously noted, contemporaries realized this. Uh, in addition, it deprived Howe of alternatives, right? His focus has to be on opening up the Delaware River. So he can't pursue Washington. He can't look to engage in any more battles with what Now Howe has been accused of being very dilatory as, as far as that goes in numerous places. And I will address that. But cons and consider, you know, the Americans abandon these posts mid-November. They cross over nor the Delaware north of Philadelphia and make their way to the White Marsh encampment. Early December, right, Howe marches out of Philadelphia trying to goad Washington into battle. So now that the Delaware is no longer taking up all of his attention, he feels he can, he can do this. Um, finally, you know, okay, so if, if this fighting is all that significant, why is it not remembered? Why is more attention not given? And I think Joseph Plum Martin has the answer. In Private Yankee Doodle, he says, the reason which there was no Washington, Putnam, or Wayne there, none of the major figures are really involved directly in the fighting. Samuel Smith is a Lieutenant Colonel from Maryland. Uh, you know, Christopher Green, a colonel from Rhode Island. These are, these are you know, it's not the, the major players, Knox, Washington, Nathaniel Green, and so forth. So are there questions? See in the... Um, well, I will throw you the first question, um, Jim. Uh, what uh, got you into all this? Um, I mean, you said that it's often overlooked, which it obviously is. Uh, what I know that had to have been some sort of an inspiration, but was there anything else behind uh, your research and wanting to write a book about this? Absolutely. Um, so in the mid 90s, when I was a, a newly minted batch, you know, graduate in history, I just received my bachelor's from Temple University. And I took a summer job as a docent at Fort Mifflin on the Delaware and started to really learn about it. And I had grown up in Springfield, Delaware County, Pennsylvania. Uh, growing up, I went to Brandywine, Valley Forge, all these sites and had never heard of Fort Mifflin and never heard about what it had done. Uh, and the, the motto of the fort was the fort that saved the revolution. And so I, I you know, I kind of had some questions about that and that started things going. So on and off through the years, um, you know, it, essentially I had started this project about 12 years ago as a serious study uh, and, and as you mentioned at the start, you know, the, the opportunity to do the Avald biography came up, but even when I was researching that, it took me back to Fort Mercer. And so once that, once uh, Johann Avald was finished, it was definitely time to get back and finish this. 
So very good, very interesting. Um, <clears throat> Now I'm going to start at the beginning of the Philadelphia campaign and we'll work our way uh, through the questions in sequential order um, of events here. Uh, now, General, it, it, it's been said that General Howe initially had the intention of sailing up the Delaware uh, at the at the outset of the Philadelphia campaign, but he chose the Chesapeake. And it's one of the uh, justifications for his decision there was the fact that the Delaware River was so heavily fortified. Um, two questions here. If General Howe did sail up the Delaware, in your opinion, how far do you think he would have gotten? And two, in your opinion, what do you think strategically would have been the best landing point for Howe given the, the massive uh, defensive system? Great questions. And, and uh, I address these in some depth in the book. So, Howe's chief and his, his main source of intelligence on the defenses is Captain Andrew Snape Hammond of the HMS Roebuck, which has been on station in the Delaware Bay. And Hammond actually was involved in fighting against some of these, uh, well, you know, they called it the Mosquito Fleet, the Pennsylvania Navy, in May of 76. So he has a really clear idea of this defensive network. And he uh, briefs but the Howe brothers, when they sail into the Delaware Bay. Um, so Howe, in my opinion, decides to turn around and, and go to the Chesapeake Bay for a few reasons. Uh, one, it might decoy Washington into thinking that he's headed to Virginia. He's headed much further south and be able to divide Washington's forces uh, even further. Um, but you see, the thing is, and, and how there's actually an inquiry, and I use the documents from the inquiry in the House of Lords in 78 as well. And Hammond is brought forward as a witness. And, and again, you know, there's all the political machinations, right, of the British aristocracy. Uh, Hammond is very careful in his testimony, but it's clear that he's kind of shocked when Hal makes this move because, and this gets to the second question, uh, there's Wilmington, Delaware, and, and not as big as Philadelphia, but still it, to launch the invasion to just move in, Washington is still north of the city at this point. So it would have given him at least, you know, um, some initiative to, to start making his move northward. Makes sense. Absolutely. Um, now, backtracking a little bit, uh, to the construction of these defenses? Who was responsible for that? Who, uh, who actually constructed this large network? Um, so unfortunately, the question almost becomes, who wasn't? Because <laughs> there's, there's a John Bull, which great name, right? Especially for building American forts at this time, uh, was a Pennsylvania militia officer who laid out both Billingsport and Fort Mercer. Now, he, he did have some experience building frontier posts, but he had never done anything to sort of block a river, right? Um, then you get Duportal, right, who uh, is, does a survey. And Dupont, like, the problem then becomes, too, so you have Duportal, uh, you have a Robert Smith from Philadelphia who comes up with the idea for the Chevaux de Free and... Uh, the machine for loading the ballast in to sink them and so forth. Uh, so it, it really is a, a sort of group effort. With the forts, the problem is, as you go from Bull to Portal, Kosciusko is involved briefly, uh, Taddeus Kosciusko, and so forth. Each engineer has their own perspective on how the defensive network should develop. And tries to implant that consequently you know that they, they focus their efforts and then they deprive the other forts of attention so it's it's ends up being very much an ad hoc affair gotcha so it was pretty much a whole all hands on deck affair uh in doing this um now getting to the Sh the Shavota free in the river um there are large obstacles uh we're how would, was there a certain technique in removing them or um, I know some of, you know, some parts have washed up 
through dredging and and um, I know Brandywine just recently acquired a full size one in 2017 after one washed up in 2012 after Sandy. Um, did the British make an attempt to remove these large obstacles or they just kind of work around them the best they could? Uh, the British do make an attempt. Now, specifically, I, I have not yet been able to track down specifically what they did to um, move them, but they do manage to move them. In 78, after the British leave, there's also talk in Congress, because now the problem is these obstructions are preventing trade from getting in and out of the city. Now, there, there were, even when even when they were trying to keep the British out, there were paths that, that the pilots knew to be able to bring ships in and out. Like they, they did think this through, they didn't lock themselves in, if you will. Um, but it, it seems, you know, and yes, they, they're, they're continuing efforts into the early 19th century to move the frames. Um, and I know that the uh, Independence Maritime Museum actually had one as well for a while that they had discovered. So yeah, they're, they're still, finding sections of them um it's so it's it's there never seemed to be a concerted effort which which in and of itself is is kind of an interesting thing because again they were purpose built in other words they they designed and constructed them to be sunk at a certain depth so they knew where they were they had it mapped out and the pilots knew so it, it's not like they'd have to go looking for them to move them Right. Okay. Just waiting for that uh, newspaper article that says a small sailing ship got stuck on a Shavota Free in the Delaware River outside of Philadelphia. Um, now, one one more question about the Shavota Free. Uh, is there any record uh, of any other locations uh, to the north or farther south of Philadelphia that you know of? That these were used. Oh, um, well, we do send advisors up to New York to talk uh, to talk to. Uh, the New York state government about building river obstructions in the Hudson. I'm not sure, certain if they ever went with the Chevo or not. I, I didn't really look at that in the end, uh, but I know they do ask for consultation. Okay. Okay. Very good. Um, now, <clears throat> before the British launch this massive uh, effort to, to take control of the waterway here, what impact did the, the lack of supplies for the British Army have on Philadelphia itself? I mean, it had to have been pretty devastating to the population living there. And um, can you talk a little bit about the, uh, the effect on the city itself? Were the British looting? Were they, you know, were they taking foraging? Uh, they're, well, and yes, they're not looting. They're attempting to forage. Um, but Washington actually orders Green out to go south as far as Wilmington and, and then Newcastle and, you know, remove all the millstones. I mean, he's really just trying to make life difficult for any foraging operations the British might launch out of the city. In the city, there are numerous accounts, both from residents and from uh, British officers about the cost of living, right? The cost of uh, commodity, how much is flour, right? How much uh, is meat if you can get it? So it's, and, and consider, right, winter's coming. So that, and, and I, it's, it, no one really says this uh, explicitly in the documents I looked at, but there's a definite feeling of, of sort of anxiety with, for the idea of we all know it's harder to get stuff to the city in winter. Sure. So if it's already expensive now, if we don't do something, this could be this could be really bad. As far as looting within the confines of Philadelphia, Howe is actually very good on that, um, on on maintaining discipline among his troops. He does, uh, you know, anyone caught marauding, as they would call it, right? It was was tried and punished, um, and. The, you know, the penalties ranging from flogging to outright execution. So, mm -hmm. okay. Very good. Um, now there's a, another question about farther south. Um, was, were there defensive fortifications built in, in small towns like Lewis, Delaware, or 
was that did they you know was that just like a warning system down there that that it was used for you know getting relaying the message up north um how can you speak to that a little bit yes uh so it's just a series of signal guns it's it's basically um these you know residents who would have really a small like a a, a cannon that could carry like a one pound charge right and so just enough so that the noise would carry northward to the next post there's nothing there's no fortifications that i found further south of billingsport okay during the fighting between billingsport and uh red bank at, in early november washington sends over uh james mitchell varnum brigadier varnum and varnum actually has a battery starts a battery at manto creek uh so that's the only additional fortification that's even started but it started further north and during the fighting Gotcha. Okay. Um, now getting to, we've got a lot of questions about Fort Mifflin here. Um, so be prepared, brace yourself. Um, what one question is, you mentioned that the current Fort Mif Mifflin on the Delaware uh, was built in the 19th century. Uh, was are there uh, significant differences or is there an original part of the 18th century fort that's still there? Um, can you speak to that a little bit? Absolutely. Um, there are sections, some of the stone used in the construction in the 19th century is from the original fort. You can still see some pock marks on the stones from uh, cannon shot. So yeah, it's definitely uh, elements of the original fort. But the, the early 19th century version is a formal Trace Italien style fort uh, with the, you know, angled walls and so forth. Um, really, the, the original was a palisaded, more like along the lines of a frontier style fortification. So the design is very, very different. If, if for, for those um, on who are, who look at 18th, 19th century engineering, well, early modern military engineering, right? The Trace Italien is that style that comes up in the 16th, well, 15th, 16th century in Europe. Um, a best example in North America would be Ticonderoga. And so, you know, large stone walls angled to reduce the impact of cannon fire and so forth. And that's what Fort, the, the newer Fort Mifflin, if you will, um, is designed to be like. And, and there are a lot of adaptations too. If you go to the site, it's, it's really kind of a journey through American military history because there's, it, it was an active site um, up into the 20th century, it was active during the Civil War as a, as a prison camp and so forth. And you see where they're experimenting with different types of guns, gunnery and fortification and so forth at the site. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it's very different in design. And I know today you can basically drive your car there, but back then obviously you had to cross uh, some water to get there. Um, typically how, how did they, get men to and from the fort if the British controlled the waterway? How frequently were they rotated in? Um, can you speak to that a little bit? Yes, uh, and let me backtrack a little bit in my slides to the sort of main map. Well, actually this will work. So uh, that's that's really how this, this network functions. The significance of Red Bank is it's the it's the jumping off point, the springboard, if you will, to get troops and supplies over to Mud Island, and so they would run run them across um, either using transport or using uh, some of the ships from the Pennsylvania Navy. And you see, they they actually had a couple wharves over on Mud Island. So the British, for the most part, now granted, yes, the the map here shows British ships further up call that artistic license, if you will, uh, because again, the British are still below the Chivo de Free at this point, really around Hog Island. So the Americans can get control of much of the upper part of the river here. Here is where my mouse is right now is the back channel, and that's meant to be the Vigilant and Fury there. Um, and because of this, because it was deemed as being too shallow, the Americans really did not 
put a lot of effort into closing off the back channel from the south, which is what allows them to be able to get these, these vessels in there in the first place. Um, but no, the, so the idea was to get troops and, and the frequency uh, really depends a lot on the weather conditions because these, these galleys and um, guard boats are shallow draft. And, and so a lot of times, and there's actually a big controversy that I deal with in the book between Smith and Hazelwood. Smith is always alleging that the, Na the Pennsylvania Navy isn't doing enough to support the fort. Hazelwood is always kind of saying, well, there's not much I can do because if, if we are having stormy weather, if, there's, if the river's choppy, I can't send my ships out, they'll, they'll flood. You know, they'll, be, they'll capsize. Um, in good conditions, they will try and bring in additional to rotate troops in and bring in supplies on a daily basis. Um, that being said, it's not like you serve for 24 hours and are relieved. You know, jo Joseph Plum Martin is there through the entire siege. It's, it's more if you're wounded, uh, you get relieved. Gotcha, understood. Um, now, focusing, a, you know, some more on Fort Mifflin um, and even Red Bank, uh, the, these bombardments were devastating. Can you speak to the, the various types of uh, rounds that were being fired at them, the size of the guns from these ships? Uh, I know you mentioned the size of the mortars that they were using. Um, can, you, can you elaborate more on the, on the weapons yes. that the British were using to bombard this? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's you know, the, the heavy gunnery of frigates and ships of the line, eight, uh, 18, 24, and 32 pounders. So firing solid iron shot, um, the mortars in the batteries on Province Island here to the northwest, um, they would fire a carcass, which is a, a sort of empty shell that would have a fuse and that, so the idea was there would be combustibles or explosives and they're very good at judging time and distance and, and velocity and so forth. So as the carcass comes over at a certain point, it explodes and showers down, right? Uh, incendiary material. So the hope they would use that to hopefully start fires at whatever structures. And there was a barracks, um, and another another house. There was actually another house on the island, uh, on Mud Island, that was torn down in the 80s. It was known locally as the Cannonball House um, for the fact that it had taken several shots during the fighting. Um, and, and Joseph Martin talks about during the siege, um, it was it was so intense, and the men were so sleep deprived. Now they knew. Right. If they went in the barracks, there was a good chance that they wouldn't come out again because the British were targeting these structures. But still, men were so just exhausted that they would they would risk it. Um, and in fact, uh, when when Lieutenant Colonel Smith is wounded and relieved, it was because he had he had received a letter from Varnum, I believe, Varnum or Washington, and he went into the barracks to write a reply. Uh, sat down at a table and a spent cannonball had literally gone down the chimney and bounced across the floor and, and hit him in the hip. Wow. Um, and that was enough for, you know, it's like uh, he's, he's taken out and, and brought across to the New Jersey side. So. Wow. Well, you, you started to hand a little bit there on the soldiers on the receiving end of this bombardment of these bombardments. Um, what, were, is there any documentation out there? I know we hear from World War One, you know, shell shock, and it's not really um, addressed in, in, in the Revolutionary War as much as it should be. Uh, what was the psychological impact on these soldiers? Uh, it had to have been excruciatingly painful for them. Well, and, and yeah, there's, I mean, in Martin's account, he talks about... Um, so the men would actually cluster. There was a low wall and it was just, it was just a wall within the fort and they would cluster behind that to try and get some sleep as opposed to the barracks. But he also talks about 
um, when they were out of ammunition within the fort, they would offer the men a gill of rum if they would retrieve a spent cannonball that they could then fire back. And he talks about in his account, now again, remember this is written many years later, um, that there were men who would line up and wait their chance to go run after a spent cannonball. Um, now, for, I, I have some problems with that <laughs> uh, because during, you know, with an embar a bombardment of this intensity, standing out in the open in line is, is just waiting to be killed. Um, so what I, and, and also there, it's well documented in many accounts, not just from the American Revolution, but the Seven Years' War down through the Napoleonic Wars uh, of spent cannonballs inflicting significant injury. You know, someone will see a cannonball rolling along the ground and try to stop it with their foot. And next thing you know, they're being taken off to the field hospital uh, to, to have their foot amputated, right? Uh, so, but as I thought about the, his account versus the weather conditions and the fact that Mud Island is actually below the water level, below the, the water table or water level, it, it, uh, m what I suggest in the book is that um, really when he's talking about spent rounds, you know, the, the shots would do their damage and then land in the central compound and maybe sink in the mud. And so once they had sunk in the mud, you know, these guys would run out from whatever cover, try and grab the, the cannonball. And, and I, I also kind of doubt because they're not getting food on a regular basis. So Four ounces of rum on an empty stomach, I don't think would be would be very good for the uh, combat effectiveness of the garrison. Um, so, and especially when they're they're exhausted as well. I think they might have been given some, maybe an ounce here and there, but um, four ounces would seem to just rem render them incapable of doing any duty um, under those conditions. And but again, I think that. To get to your bigger question, I think that whole part of his account kind of speaks to their their traumatic stress, right? That they, you know, the idea that they are so exhausted that they'll actually risk running out in the middle of this massive bombardment to try and dig a, a shell, a dig a cannonball out of a mud puddle and bring it to one of the guns. Like they're they're clearly not thinking reasonably at that point. Sure, makes sense. Makes perfect sense. Um, now the million dollar question, was it worth it for the British in the long run? Uh, to open the Delaware? And, and yeah, well, I mean, with <laughs> everything that transpires, you know, them abandoning Philadelphia, was it really worth it in the end? <laughs> um, it, it, it would seem not. <laughs> uh, because the, the how really can't do anything with Phil and, and that's again part of the, the case I make in the book is like you know um, in, in his classic uh, revolutionary people at war Charles Royster says the 77 campaign gave with one hand and took with another you know Saratoga meant that there would be a French alliance but the Philadelphia campaign meant the war would protract um, and, and I, I think Charles Royster was was an excellent historian of the revolution, and that's an, an excellent uh, book. It's a classic, but I think you know it, 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 again doesn't pay a lot of attention to this campaign, and I think part of it is you know what people miss about the Philadelphia campaign because all the focus is Saratoga, right? Saratoga French alliance done. If a bit of alternative history to answer that big question, if Howe had penetrated the, if he had landed at Wilmington, done a quick march and seized Philadelphia, or actually, what, one thing I've explored in a couple places, if you know, if Washington, if, if he had defeated the Continental Army, and and destroyed it, and, and I'm I'm going to pull out Clausewitz now, right? If he had broken that center of gravity either the Continental Army um, or captured the Congress or elements thereof, you know, the political or the military parts of that center, those centers of gravity. Um, this would have been a much more successful campaign and Saratoga might not have meant that much, you know, here a British army surrendered, 
Yes, but the Continental Army, the main Continental Army has been crushed. It's a it's an even sum game. Um, I think the fact that in the Philadelphia campaign, Powell, yes, takes the capital, but it doesn't really affect the government. Uh, they just pick up and move to York. And I think as a consequence, um, there's no counterbalance, right? I, I think Philadelphia makes Saratoga so significant because there is no counterbalancing British victory to offset the loss at Saratoga. And, and for the fact that in this campaign, and especially in the defense of the river forts, the Americans show a great deal of stamina, that they're not just going to make some kind of negotiated peace with Britain and end this, that they really are in it for the protracted war that Royster talks about. I think that's also a powerful element in getting Versailles to agree to the alliance. I think that is some great insight, and I think that's a great place to wrap things up. President McIntyre, I want to thank you very much for your presentation tonight and for taking the time to speak with us. Uh, this was another well-attended program that did generate a lot of interest, and I hope this offers some incentive for everybody to go out and uh, pick up a copy of your book when it hits the shelves. And can you give us a little bit more on that, uh, when the estimated time frame? <laughs> uh, right now, we are looking at uh, late March, early April. So okay. it, it is coming soon. Very good. Sooner All than right. later. Very good. Well, um, thank you again. It, it very much appreciated. This was very fascinating. So thank we, you. And it was yep. a pleasure and, and an honor and a pleasure. Thank you again. Absolutely. Uh, now, before I officially conclude tonight's program, I'd like to point out to you all out there uh, that as you leave tonight, a Google form survey will appear on your screen. And we kindly ask that you share your thoughts about tonight's program, as well as any suggestions you have for other topics you would like us to cover in future programs. As always, your feedback is most helpful as we develop that future programming calendar. I would also like to, uh, you to, to invite you to our events page on our website, www.americanrevolutioninstitute.org, where you can learn more about our upcoming historical programs. Uh, our next historical program is a virtual author's talk that will be held on Zoom Wednesday, March 2nd, and will feature Dr. Richard Middleton, who will be discussing his forthcoming and highly anticipated biography of Charles Cornwallis, entitled Cornwallis, Soldier and Statesman in a Revolutionary World. Now, as he will be joining us live from England, this program will be held earlier in the day at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Registration is currently open for that, as uh, well as all of our other programs. So with that, on behalf of the American Revolution Institute of the Society of the Cincinnati, I'd like to thank you all again for joining us this evening and for your continued support of our mission. I wish you all a great evening and until next time. Uh, thank you and good night, everyone. Thank you.